All right, hi, I'm Roger. Uh, I'm part of the adult program here at Relentless Fitness. I'm speaking to you today about some nutrition. So, looking out to this room, who can tell me what they last ate? Just anyone, shout it out. What'd you last eat? Sour Patch Kid. Sour Patch Kid. <laughs> what else? <laughs> what else you got? Chocolate. Chocolate. What else? Sun Chips. Sun Chips. All right, Sour Patch Kid, why'd you eat it? <laughs> right? Were you hungry? Just kind of. No, just sitting there? Cool. So we're the only species that eats not based on survival, right? We eat for a lot of different reasons. We eat for social situations, for weddings, for birthdays, for office parties, because it was just sitting there, because someone put it in front of our face. We just eat things, right? Think about who has a pet? Raise your hand if you have a pet. All right? Dogs, cats, right? If your dog had an upset stomach and you took it to the vet, Right? What would happen? Would you, you know, and the doc, the doc said, the vet said, hey, your dog's upset because he's eating this, and now he has to eat this. Would you consider feeding him what was upsetting his stomach, or would you feed the dog what made him healthy, happy, and energetic? You'd probably change the food, right? So what about us? Why do we eat things that make us upset? All right. So I'm here tonight to present a new model for eating, all right? and that is for looking, feeling, and performing better. So I think everyone in this room can agree with me on two goals, looking better and feeling better, right? I think, can everyone agree? Yeah. You wanna look better, you wanna have better composition, skin, all that great stuff, and you wanna feel better. You wanna have more energy in the morning, you wanna pop up in the morning without a snooze button, you wanna be able to go to sleep, you wanna be able to get you know, eight, eight to nine hours of sleep and stay asleep. Um, and then the third goal, performing better, right? I think most of, some of us, if not most of us in this room, probably have some sort of physical goal, and that could be performing in an intramural softball league all the way up to running a marathon, or competing in a competition like Charlie, right? Some sort of physical goal. So looking, feeling, and performing better, it's a new model, all right? So take a look down at yourself, your hands, everything, legs, body, you are what you eat, like literally. Like that's the energy that you put in your body that makes you. All right, so you are what you eat. No matter, you know, we're, we're, we're in an exercise facility right now, Relentless Fitness, no matter how much exercise you do, I don't care, if you eat crap, you will be crap. That, that's just how it is, you are what you eat. So, there's this field, there's this new science, fairly new, it's called epigenetics. And epigenetics is all about how we influence our genetic expression, all right? How much control we have over our genetic destiny. And today, we're realizing we have more control than we once thought. Uh, we once thought, hey, if, if I'm genetically predisposed to fill in the blank, then that's probably where I'll end up at some point. But they're running through all these crazy studies now through uh, mice and lab rats, and they're taking sibling mice, and they're putting them on two separate diets, and they're letting time elapse. And after time elapses, they look nothing like siblings. They, they don't even look like they belong to the same families at all. So we have control over our genetic destinies. We can forge our destinies. And if you don't believe me, is anyone a little skeptical of that? Like, eh. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at diabetes, okay? So diabetes, we have an epidemic there. Incidences of type two diabetes have nearly doubled within the last 10 years, okay? 10 years. Our population has come nowhere near double. That's epigenetics. We're creating something that was not there, right? We're creating a you know, condition that was not in some of our ancestors. And if we go further and further and further back, you can see less and less and less of it. So we can create it. My theory is we can also destroy it too, all right? So something today is broken. We have two, two epidemics on our hands. The first epidemic is obesity. All right? And according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we have 33.8% of all U.S. adults are obese. That sucks. That's a lot. And $147 billion in the year 2008 was spent taking care of the obese. Second epidemic is diabetes. 8.3% of the total population is type 2 diabetic. $218 billion in the year 2007 were spent on diabetes. And 231,000 plus deaths in 2007 were caused by diabetes. That's a lot. And it's a shame to think that we have some semblance of control over that, and maybe 
we aren't exercising. So something today is broken. We're stuck in this calories in, calories out, diets, fads model, right? It's like calories, calories, calories have been it for like the past decade. You know, you need to reduce your calories, you need to count your calories, and if you want to be healthier, you need to be focused on your calories. And it's everywhere you look. At restaurants, right? You go in restaurants. What are they doing now on menus? Putting calories on there, right? You should look for the lower calorie foods, at least according to, you know, government and everything like that. Calories, calories, calories. You go to Starbucks, you look in the, in the pastry tray, they're counting calories. Sid told me the other day, he drank a Frappuccino because it was only 130 calories. Sorry, Sid. <laughs> all right, so I want to flip it. My mind is not about calories at all. Well, I'm not going to say not at all. It's less about calories, and it's more about selection. Selecting well what you put into your body. All right, I want everyone to think about something for me. If I took this half of the room here and I gave you 500 calories, good Ben and Jerry's ice cream, all right? And I gave this side of the room 500 calories each, quality lean meat and veggies, okay? Then we waited an hour and I asked you all to complete the Relentless Challenge, which for those of you who don't know is a really intense physical challenge. How are you guys gonna feel? on that Ben and Jerry's. You're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna wanna get after it and do some pull-ups and all that good stuff? Yeah. How, how does this side of the room think they fare? Think you feel like it? Sure. Lean mean veggies? But the point is, do you think both sides of the room would be in the same place after eating 500 calories of these foods and these foods? No. Like, think about it, right, right in your gut. Does it make sense to you that eating 500 calories of Ben and Jerry's ice cream does the same for your body, weight-wise, performance-wise, right, as 500 calories of lean meat and veggies. Doesn't make any sense to me. Calorie model is broken. It's all about selection. If you select well, your body will thrive. If you select well, we're gonna eliminate disease. And if you select well and subscribe to my model, we're gonna look, feel, and perform better. All right, so that brings us to the grand question. If you agree with any of that, what do we do, right? What makes us look, feel, and perform better? And that brings us to why we're here tonight, which is paleo, right? I think everyone saw on the email that word paleo, paleo nutrition. So our premise is something is broken today. We're heading down the wrong road. Obesity is increasing, diabetes is increasing. The core of paleo is learning from the past. We're turning it around and we're looking at yesterday throughout all of our genetic line, all the way back 2.6 million years ago and everything in between. All right? And we're looking at it and we're saying, what can we learn from when diabetes was halved and then before that when it was halved and halved and halved and all the way when there was really no predominant diseases? Let's look at those role models. So let's play compare and contrast. One of the great ways we have to study, hey, what are these ways of eating that work, is to take a look at hunter-gatherer societies that are on their own, outside of Western culture, doing their own thing. First of all, you won't find disease there. You find very, very, very little disease. So, we have some studies to look to. We have 229 ethnographic studies, that's basically, basically observational studies, that show us what hunter-gatherer societies operating on their own eat. And they find that 26 to 35 percent of calories are from gathered plant and fruit food. 56 to 65 percent of those calories are from fish and hunted animal foods. Take it a step further, 13 quantitative studies that's a little stricter, um, better studies. Um, they show that 36%, uh, they consume 36% plant food and 64% animal food. Goes without saying, this is something that they're either taking down with their own hands, pulling from the ground, picking from the trees. There's no processing involved here. And no <coughs> surprise, there's no disease either. How about now, right? What are we doing now? Um, so what then, we've covered that, you've got plant and animal food that you're picking from the trees, pulling from the ground, and, and uh, eating from animals. What are we doing now? So in the last 10,000 years, or if we were to look at our genetic line as a football field, within the one yard line, so within a little fraction of the one yard line, what have we introduced into our culture that might be at the root of our disease? 10,000 years ago, sheep, goats, and cows were domesticated. 10,000 years ago, wheat and barley were domesticated. 9,000 years ago, dairying began. Six to 7,000 years ago, wine and beer. Five to six for salt mines. And 2,500 years ago, sucrose was introduced, all right? 
then we pick up the pace. We got to the industrial era, and then now we're really getting good at it, and we're really getting good at processing these things. So, sucrose goes to the masses 200 years ago. Feedlots start, and that basically produces much fattier meats. That begins 150 years ago. Refined grains, 125. Refined vegetable oils, 100. And high fructose corn syrup, 25 years ago. All right? And again, all that is within the one yard line of our genetic line. So 70.9% of the calories we consume in the U.S. come from refined grains, dairy, refined vegetable oils, and refined sugars. 70.9% of the calories that we eat. Okay? Now, you know, you're thinking, all right, well, it's, maybe it's not great to eat some of these things, but the worst part is they're displacing other foods from our diets that we were relying on for nutrition. Right? So not only are we eating these less than ideal foods, but we're pushing out of our diets the ideal. Let's go through those culprits again. Cereal grains, 23.9% of calories. Dairy, 10.6% of calories. Refined sugars, 18.6% of calories. And refined vegetable oils, 17.8% of calories. So what are the nutritional implications of eating this way? Who's familiar with glycemic load? Anybody? Charlie, you want to? Like your two cents? It relates how the um, food raises your blood sugar and your insulin process in relation to how much people really eat, which is different than the glycemic index compared to a set amount of what you're trying to do. Awesome. Awesome. Great. So let's boil it down impact on blood sugar. I think for, for now, we can simplify it down to that impact on blood sugar. Fatty acid balance. Who's familiar? Anyone here? The word omega 3, omega 6 tossed around? Different kinds of fats, right? All right, so our body cares about what ratio uh, we get those fats in. And if that ratio gets out of whack, if, uh, and what's happening is we're getting a lot, a lot, a lot more omega-6s, if that ratio gets out of whack, the body doesn't like that so much. Macronutrient balance, we're getting higher carbohydrate consumption than ever, 